and welcome to the Mahindra Humanities Centre in this event of our Environment Forum. Uh, my name is Sunil Amrith, I'm Interim Director of the Centre. Um, and the Mahindra Humanities Centre, as many of you know, aims to foster conversations about the humanities in the most capacious sense of that term. And with that in mind, I can't think of, of any forum more urgent and timely in terms of how we live in the world than the Environment Forum that Ian Miller and Robin Kelsey have convened. This is, I think, its third year. Um, and Ian will introduce our wonderful speaker, Bath Shiba Dumuz. I just want to say what a personal pleasure it is. I first heard Bath Shiba present her work in this very building. I think it was actually in the next room about four or five years ago. And since then, I've watched this amazing work uh, um, develop in, in different forms, and most recently with her amazing new book, Floating Coast. Uh, so Ian, as convener of the Environment Forum, um, and Introduce our speaker, please. Sir. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sunil. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ian Miller, and uh, I am co convener, as uh, Professor Amrith so kindly uh, reminded us, of the uh, Environment Forum at the Mahindra Humanities Center. I share that honor with uh, Professor Robin Kelsey the Shirley Carter Burden Professor of Photography and Dean of Arts and Humanities here at Harvard University. I'm so pleased that everyone could join us this evening. Thank you for making time. It's a busy time of the semester. It seems like everything is crunched together at this, at this moment. Um, and we sat watching the tide flow in as you all came through the door, uh, grateful uh, that you have made time for this evening's important talk and event. I couldn't be more excited uh, to introduce a speaker at the forum. Tonight's speaker, Bathsheba DeMuth, is Assistant Professor of History and Environment at, and Society at Brown University. She is simply remarkable at what she does, and remarkable in so many ways that it's difficult to summarize. So uh, I thought I'd try to do three, uh, only three things that I highlight from Professor DeMuth's uh, kind of intimidatingly accomplished CV for someone who's been a professor for three years already uh, so far. Uh, but let me, get, let me uh, give it a try, just three. Um, how many folks in the audience have visited the Arctic? One, two. Professor DeMuth, before she even went off to college, didn't just visit the Arctic, she moved there. She left high school and thought she was heading up to the Yukon for two months. She stayed for two years. She spent two years living there uh, with local folks, mushing dogs, and eating whatever her local friends ate, which meant a good deal of walrus and other exotic foodstuffs, among other things. The other item that I wanted to highlight is entirely selfish and narcissistic, and I apologize for this, but I can't help it. Um, as an Iowan myself, I have to give Bathsheba a shout out, solidarity, uh, fellow Iowan. She may have visited the, uh, and lived in the Arctic and become an expert in the field that I'm going to dub this evening the history of the global north, that is the very, very far north. But she was raised in the epicenter of American culture, that fine town, gleaming, gleaming city that it is, Decorah, Iowa. I imagine that that's more unusual in this room and in this setting than having been to the Arctic or uh, having spent some time in the Yukon. For those of you who haven't been, let me just, uh, we can count this as a, uh, you know, an ad for Iowa tourism. Decor is a lovely place. It's flat out beautiful. It's, and and uh, that's any time of year. And the mosquitoes are far better in Decorah than they are in the Yukon. So these are fun bits of trivia. Um, but of course, it's Professor DeMuth's third accomplishment that brings her here tonight. Professor DeMuth is a simply brilliant, as I mentioned, environmental historian and a writer of elegant prose. And those, the combination of those two gifts is fairly unusual and merits consideration and mention here tonight. Um, her first book, Floating Coast, an environmental history of the Bering Strait is gripping reading. I won't ask you to raise hands if you've uh, read it or not, but I imagine given the, given the turnout tonight that many of you have, and those of you who have not have seen the various and glowing reviews in places as diverse as the New York Times book review, National Public Radio, uh, and the journal Nature. Across the spectrum, from the public to the scientific, uh, 
and of course within academic circles. Floating Coast is a tour de force of analytical precision and narrative verb, verve, excuse me. In its pages, we see Beringia, Arctic land and waters reaching from Russia to Canada through Bathsheba's eyes. We learn to look through those eyes with the vision of a scholar who's comfortable, as comfortable thinking with Chukchi indigenous peoples as she is questioning the actions of socialist scientists and capitalist, capitalist sea captains. We learn to see the movement of energy through the ecosystem uh, in its fossil fueled forms and in the movement of the creatures that raise their heads above the waves. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Professor DeMuth here this evening to congratulate her on the brilliant narrative accomplishment of the book and uh, to ask all of you to join me in saying thank you for your time and welcome to Harvard. So thank you, Ian. I feel like as a fellow Iowan, you should know that um, praise of that sort runs the danger of having me just simply catch flame and spontaneously combust <laughs> before I even get to speak. Um, so thank you very much for that generous welcome and thank you all uh, for coming on a sort of blustery November evening. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, if for any reason you can't, please wave your hands and I'll make sure that I'm close enough to the microphone. Um, I want to preface this talk very briefly by saying um, I have no desire to offend any vegetarians or vegans in the room. This is a pretty carnivorous uh, story that I'm about to tell, um, and it's kind of necessarily one of gore. So uh, forewarned is forearmed, I hope. And it's a historical story, but it's actually one that I'm going to start in the relatively recent past, um, about two years ago, when a bowhead whale uh, like this one swam north around the edge of St. Lawrence Island. Um, and St. Lawrence Island is that little green dot uh, down in the corner of the map there. And this whale was massive. Um, she was about 60 feet long. She weighed 60 or 70 tons. And she was probably about 200 years old. And over that lifespan, what this whale did in the oceans that she inhabited um, was make the Beaufort and the Chukchi um, and the Bering Sea, which are the waters that surround the Bering Strait, more alive. By surfacing and diving, whales churn nutrients into the water column, bringing kind of the rich um, phosphorus and nitrogen and iron that sinks to the bottom um, up to the surface, where it becomes part of the photosynthetic life um, that's the basis of the entire Bering Sea ecosystem. So the diatoms and the little algaes that then go on to feed these giant clusters of krill, um, the small crustaceans and other animals, um, which in turn feed schools of fish. Um, they feed the seabirds and other species that come north on the Pacific flyway um, and summer in the Arctic because of this abundance. So oceans that have bowhead whales in them or have great whale species in them in general um, are more alive. They have more capacity to make life within their ecosystems and places where they are um, not whales feel their absence. And whales, even when they die, go on to kind of feed an entire world of species underneath the waves. This is um, a still from a video that was shot just a couple of weeks ago by a group of NOAA scientists who stumbled across this phenomenon called whale fall which is what happens when a great whale dies and sinks to the ocean floor and ends up feeding an entire kind of world of species on the bottom of the ocean, animals that otherwise don't have access to the protein and the fat um, that's more plentiful at the surface. And if you ever just want a chance to geek out listening to these NOAA scientists who are kind of going along with their little submersible looking at the seafloor and then come across this is really a joy. Another part of the work that whales have done uh, for at least 2,000 years, and probably somewhat longer than that, is make energy that people can use. They have sustained populations of permanent, um, non-nomadic peoples all along the Bering Strait. Um, and the villages that are on this map, you can see many of them are along kind of the bowhead whales annual migration route. So places that the whales come past in the summer and the autumn um, as they're following the edge of the sea ice and along with the edge of the sea ice following all of that krill um, that is the basis of their food. 
the distant ancestors of the people that live on St. Lawrence Island um, were able to wait, make from Wales permanent settlements. Um, and this is a hard thing to do in a place where there are no trees, um, so you can't uh, build things very easily, where agriculture is impossible. Um, but there's so much energy in a whale that you could have settlements of two or 300 people um, who are primarily eating bowhead whale flesh. And bowhead whales continue to be extremely important to Yupik communities and um, Inupiaq communities in the present. And so in the summer of 2017, that 200-year-old bowhead whale, as she was swimming along the edge of St. Lawrence Island, was harpooned by a young Yupik man named Chris Apasengok. He was 16 years old at the time, and to be a 16-year-old who makes the first strike on a bowhead whale um, in his hometown of Gamble, which is right on the kind of corner of St. Lawrence Island facing Russia, um, is an enormous kind of work of importance within your community. Part of that importance is very material. It's ex extremely expensive to feed yourself in Gamble. It's a village that's supplied almost entirely by airplane. And that means that when I'm up there visiting and I'm sort of not um, in someone's family, it costs about $50 a day just to feed myself. So if you have a family of four or five or six people, just sort of getting enough sustenance if you don't have access to the foods that the ocean provides um, is extraordinarily expensive um, and essentially unsustainable. It's also a place where access to foods that are shipped in and come in by airplane is not necessarily consistent. The middle of the Bering Sea is not the easiest place to land an airplane every single day of the week. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So having local access to food is a matter of sort of basic security, both financially um, and in terms of the, the logistical practicalities. But being able to put the first strike on a bowhead whale is also a really critical cultural moment. Um, it makes someone in the Yupik understanding of the world not just a successful hunter, um, but somebody who is a provider, a sustainer, and in a really critical sense, a full person. Um, it's part of being able to participate in the lives of your community um, in a very kind of concrete and important way that without doing, you're sort of never quite arrived in the status of complete personhood. And Chris Apasengok is not a very talkative person. He's a pretty laconic uh, fellow. Um, but his cousin explained to me when I was up in 2017 that the way in which you know, he and other hunters of bowheads understand um, the work that they do is something about sustaining not just their relationship with the human beings in their community, but with people in general. Um, and by people, they mean all sorts of beings. It's a way of kind of uniting and pulling together the universe in which you live. So putting the first strike on a whale is a transformative act for a 16-year-old. So Chris did what any 16-year-old in 2017 would do. He posted the news on Facebook. Shortly after Chris posted news that he had had killed this bowhead whale, a man named Paul Watson found Chris's post. Paul Watson is a man who's willing to go extremely far for whales. Um, in the 1970s, as one of the initial members of the Greenpeace organization, he would put his body directly between the harpoons of Soviet whaling ships and the bodies of sperm whales in order to protect them um, off the California coast. And in the 1980s, he snuck into Soviet waters and evaded KGB capture in order to document the ways in which the Soviet Union was using gray whales in order to feed fox farms. And he's still quite legendary along the coast of the Bering Sea for having kind of snuck in and snuck out. By the 2000s, he was the star of a reality television program called Whale Wars, uh, where he would take a ship usually off Antarctica, to track Japanese whaling vessels and interrupt their whaling patterns the same way he had with the Soviet whalers. But he was also, by 2017, quite a controversial figure and remains one. He's formally kind of disavowed by Greenpeace um, for being sort of too radical in his approach. But he also has tens of thousands of followers on Facebook and other social media, um, and some of them are quite well-known celebrities. And Watson saw a passing gawk just as another kind of whale killer, and described him on Facebook as, quote, 
a murdering little bastard guilty of snuffing out the life of this unique, self-aware, intelligent, social, sentient being. Within a couple of hours, a passing gawk was receiving death threats. And the justification for calling for the death of a teenager was his absolute lack of a relationship with bowhead whales. And then social media descended, as social media tends to do, into a complete impasse. On the one hand, uh, the kind of environmentalist lovers of whales took to their barricades and kind of doubled down on Watson's interpretation of a passing gox barbarism. And on the other hand, indigenous activists spoke up and invoked the colonial history that was very much behind uh, this approach. Yet, Chris Passengok and Paul Watson both evoked, in the way that they discussed whales and their relationship with bowheads, a profound bond and a deep and abiding relationship between the whales and themselves. And both have very actively labored in the service of continuing that relationship over time. It's just that their conclusions about what kind of labor is acceptable between people and whales is diametrically opposed. What I want to do in this talk is explore how we got to this impasse through a history of how people have related to whales in the Bering Strait, and then spend a little, of little bit of time in a slightly more speculative place than I usually inhabit as a historian to think about what we might take from this varied history of human-whale interactions in the past to think about present relationships between people and the environments that we inhabit. And it's a story that I'm going to tell through three groups of whalers, one group of uh, environmentalists, and what we know of the bowhead whales themselves. And I'm going to be doing it all pretty quickly, so please forgive the inevitable kind of flattening of historical and cultural and indeed animal particularity that I'm going to have to indulge in. Where I'm going to start is with the kind of initial group of whalers um, who both have the longest relationship um, and kind of the most present hunting relationship with bowhead whales in the Bering Strait. And that are Yupik folks on St. Lawrence Island. And these photos here are of uh, bowhead whale jaws from St. Lawrence Island. And as soon as you walk off the plane, when you arrive in Gamble, signs of the kind of human relationship with bowhead whales and dependence on them is everywhere. Um, these jaw bones are all along the beach. Um, and used to be kind of pieces of people's houses. Um, this is a photograph from the Russian side of the Bering Strait from a Yupik settlement that was um, actually inhabited up until the 1940s when the Soviet Union closed it. And what looks like it might be driftwood covering over a, what is an underground house are actually the jawbones and ribs of bowhead whales. Um, it's a place that doesn't have any trees, so construction materials are very scarce, and in this case, um, bowhead whales ended up being very critical. And in fact, many people, as a result of this, literally lived inside the heads of whales because the jaws were sort of critical pieces that were covered over with walrus hides. But of course, for a whale to become someone's house, it has to die. And the people who killing the bowheads, however, did not see them as objects um, or as sort of just kind of material objects to go grasp out of the environment, but rather as part of a universe where the kind of hard dividing line between subjects and objects that certainly I and my Iowan upbringing, and I would imagine many people in this room, grew up with. Instead, whales were one of many kind of being or non-human person um, that made up an incredibly animate and lively universe. Um, where walruses and the stones on the hillsides and the sort of way the tides operated were all subjects that were critical pieces of constituting what lives were like. One person described this to me on St. Lawrence Island as if you were walking through a field full of grass and you looked down and you realized that each blade of grass was a snake that was just kind of looking up and taking it in and observing who you were, and you probably didn't want to anger that snake um, because they really were able to kind of press in their desires on your life. And within this kind of lush and animate universe, whales were understood as being kind of a particular kind of person and the, with a particular character to their souls. And in particular, whales lived in a 
separate country. They had their own social world of laws um, and would leave their country each spring to come past St. Lawrence Island. And perhaps in doing so, they would consent to be hunted by the people who lived there. And this is sort of a critical piece, both of the, the oral histories about uh, Yupik hunting and the contemporary way in which Yupik hunters carry out their practice, which is understanding that whales in their own country, even very far away from the space of humans, are observing what people do. And if people are mean to each other, if they hit their children, if they are not generous with what they have hunted or with the money that they have earned, um, if they are mean in some way within their community, the whales will observe this, they will judge it, and they will choose not to come close enough to St. Lawrence Island to be effectively hunted by the whaling boats. And even when they do swim close to St. Lawrence Island, many hunters now and also in the historical record describe a set of behaviors around the interactions between the whaling boats and the whales which is that when a whaling boat goes out, there's usually a harpooner sitting on the right side of the boat, um, and that often a bowhead whale will swim around the edges of one of these crafts, sometimes for 90 minutes or a couple of hours, just outside of harpoon range, and then at some point will either dive and swim away or dive and come up on the side of the boat that's next to the harpooner. The understanding on the part of Yupik whalers is that this is a sign of consent on the part of the whale to be hunted, and that it is that action that is critical to sort of take the next step um, that Chris Passengok did, for example, and actually pursue the whale and eventually kill it. Out of this emerges an ethics in which the, it's not just people alone who are making up the ideas of what moral behavior is and what sort of is right within society, Instead, the kind of sense of righteous action and being a good person, of living a good and worthy life, is to live up to the standards of persons, some of which are human and some of which are not. Now, I can't go ask the bowhead whales what they're doing when they participate in this behavior. And it is truly one of the great tragedies of my professional life that I can't go talk to the bowheads because they live for two centuries. So think of all the things that they have seen and yet. But we do know is that for the vast majority of history between human beings and bowhead whales, the experience of bowheads was of human beings being an occasional and relatively minor threat along the edges um, of their migration routes each year. About 100 whales per year were hunted um, prior to the 1900s, um, and that was out of a population of somewhere between 20 and 30,000 animals, so a relatively small number. And so their experience of human beings was one of pretty limited risk. This, however, all changes in 1848, which is the year that whaling ships, um, in particular a whaling ship that left from not very far from here, uh, from New Bedford, Massachusetts, arrived in the Bering Strait. And the whaling ships were there because they had essentially killed their way through the species closer to home that provided um, the, the oil and the baleen that they were trying to uh, bring back to market. And the first ship into the Bering Strait described um, what to the whalers seemed like an absolute bonanza. It was a place filled with fat whales, whales that had so little fear of the whaling ships that sometimes they would actually just come up and bump into them and make the ships kind of rock and list because these are very large animals, but had no fear of the harpoons whatsoever. And some of the whaling logs actually kind of describe the whales seeming to offer themselves up to die. What these whalers who arrived in the Bering Strait did with the whales, however, operated from a very different um, kind of way of valuing the animals than was kind of active in the Bering Strait at the time. First of all, the whalers did not generally eat the bowhead whales that they killed, and they certainly didn't live in their bones. Instead, they were in the Bering Strait for whale oil, which, if you were at Harvard in 1848, was probably lighting your classrooms, um, and certainly lighting the lighthouses and many of the street lamps and the wealthier homes all around Boston, New York, Providence, and other cities up and down the eastern seaboard 
It was considered some of the best quality lighting oil that you could get your hands on. And in addition to that, the baleen, which is the kind of strainer that this species of whale has in their mouths, was used for all sorts of um, applications that we would now use stiff plastic for. Um, so things like umbrella parts, um, various bits that go into whips and the way that you fasten um, trunks and things like that. But most critically, it was used for women's corsets. Um, the best, highest quality women's undergarments were made out of whale bones. And the whalers who arrived in the Bering Strait were very, very aware um, of the cost of um, whale oil on the market and of baleen because their work, which often went on for years, because to arrive in the Bering Strait from New Bedford, Massachusetts, requires going all the way south in the Atlantic, around South America, and then all the way north through the Pacific. So they were often gone for two years or more at a time. They received no wage or salary for doing this. They were only paid as a percentage of the catch when they got back to the port um, and sold off their, their oil and baleen. If you were captain, you might get you know, 2% or 5% or 10% of the catch. If you were some you know, Ishmael type who signed on because whaling seemed like something to do and you ended up drunk next to somebody in bed in a saloon, um, you might get one one hundred and fifty percent if, however you say that, um, tiny, tiny share of what the catch was. So for the whalers, the kind of immediate value put on the animals was in the, the sort of sale of barrels of oil and then kind of secondarily the baleen. This is not to say, however, that the whalers were not observing the animals they were killing and thinking about them in ways that have certain amounts of echoes with the ways in which Yupik whalers talk about them. The Yankee whalers in their logbooks leave all sorts of hints um, that they saw whales as kind of agented animals that learned from their experience. Um, these are pictures from a whaling logbook where they actually drew little bubbles, you know, giving the whales a literal voice within the logbooks, um, one of them saying, not this time, um, because he got away. Um, and in many other situations, the whalers describe um, the difficulty of killing whales because they could see in the whale's eyes the suffering that the animal was experiencing or observed whales taking care of each other within the moment of the hunt. They particularly noticed the ways in which female whales would try to guard younger whales within a group um, or that whales that were wounded would be protected by other whales within a pod if they came across a group of whales together. And so whalers in some moments in their logbooks describe something kind of like a mortal wound or a moral wound um, that they were experiencing in the process of whaling. And they also observed very carefully and very closely that after about two years of contact with the Yankee fleet, the behavior of bowhead whales changes completely. They do not run into Yankee whaling ships anymore. They there's no language in the logbooks about whales offering themselves up to be killed. And instead, the whalers start to notice that the bowhead whales use the sea ice in a completely different way. There always have been animals that live right on the edge of the sea ice, but after a couple years of experience with the Yankee whaling ships, they would hear the sound of whale boats hitting the water, and they would run into the sea ice, um, and they would hang out, as this kind of painting shows, uh, kind of past the edge where you can safely take a, a wooden whaling ship. And the whalers start calling the whales shy and wild and canny and kind of giving them a whole other set of attributes than the first time they saw them. So if you were being speculative here, you might say that whales were rejecting with their behavior the idea of dying for these capitalist whaling ships. They certainly changed the way they interacted with them quite profoundly. And there is no indication from the oral history record that they stopped dying for Yupik whalers in the same period. It's a tricky set of sources, but if you're being speculative, you can make that leap. However, commercial whalers did eventually learn uh, how to push closer into the sea ice. And in fact, in many cases, were driven to come closer into the sea ice 
uh, because the economic pressures in their industry were so high. There were many more wrecks after they start pursuing bowhead whales um, up onto the ice pack, um, but they were able to do so, and by you know the 1870s and 1880s, are back to killing bowhead whales in large numbers. And this is despite the fact that the whalers have quite intimate knowledge of what's going on. Many of them are concerned and using the word extinction, um, which is now kind of an available piece of vocabulary. But whalers did not have access to ways of valuing the animals when they were still alive. They were only sort of turned into something that was tangibly useful to a human being when they were dead, when they had become oil and baleen. And you can get a sense of this from the logbooks, which are kind of over and over recitations of latitude, longitude, daily weather, and how many barrels of oil and how many pounds of baleen were harvested in a particular day. And that's kind of the dominant form of these logbooks, is taking a whale and reducing it down to its kind of constituent parts that could be sold. And sometimes, as the, the whale with the number 145 in its belly shows, they would actually use stamps that were specific to each whale species, and that's the number of barrels of oil um, that that particular animal yielded. So there's kind of a graphical rep representation of a whale that has become just the number of oil barrels it could produce. And as a result of this kind of impulse that sort of gave whalers no recourse um, kind of no way to let the actions of the whales that they were observing and their own kind of emotional response to it to have any sort of official recourse. It was not something anybody cared about when you went and sold your, uh, your catch on the, the piers in, Saint, or in um, New Bedford. It meant that they just kept killing the whales more or less until there were barely any left to kill. This resulted in widespread famine in Yupik communities um, around the Bering Strait. And it also uh, pushed the whale population uh, quite into a, a population bottleneck. By the time commercial whaling of this kind of tall ship Yankee sort ends in 1907, um, there's about 3,000 bowheads left from that population that was somewhere between 20 and 30. So it's a, it's a massive kind of calamity within the world of bowhead whales. What ends the, the kind of commercial whale hunt in this particular era is the replacement of um, whale oil for lighting with petroleum products, which starts to happen in the 1850s, but you know is really online by the end of the 19th century, and then the replacement of baleen um, by spring steel and early plastics, which is why in 1907 there's essentially no market anymore for bowhead whales. And whaling in general is very much in decline. So it looks like whaling might just have been a 19th century story. But it turns out it's also a 20th century phenomenon. And it's a 20th century phenomenon because of a set of technological changes, most of which are driven by the Norwegians um, in the 1920s. First of all, the Norwegians figure out how to build these massive factory ships um, where you'd have a central processor, like is what's at the bottom of the screen there, which is surrounded by a small fleet of these catcher ships, which is what's in the kind of middle position, um, that had these very high-powered harpoon guns attached to them and were able to take down whales um, that were much larger and much faster than what could be hunted by a, a kind of Moby Dick-style wooden ship. Um, so they were killing blue whales and fin whales and humpback whales. They were killing what right whales were left in the oceans. Basically, any kind of whale species you came across could be harvested by these kinds of ships. And the Norwegians had come up with another uh, kind of innovation, which was why they were killing the whales. Um, and that was a chemical process that allowed the separation of whale fat from basically the taste of whale. So you could go out and harvest a blue whale and turn it into massive quantities of margarine. So if you grew up in Norway or a couple of other northern European countries or in Great Britain or in Germany for some years and you used you know, margarine on your toast, it was probably coming from whale. It's actually where the, the kind of giant conglomerate Unilever gets its original start, um, is in harvesting <coughs> whales. So this is in many ways a kind of continuation of the capitalist hunt, but it gets its own kind of socialist variation in the 1930s. Um, which is when the Soviet Union decides um, that they also want to participate in factory whaling at sea. 
And the original kind of impulse for factory whaling seems like it partly came from simply a desire to keep up with what the, the capitalist world was doing. But during the Second World War really takes on a, a, a sort of genuine urgency within the Soviet Union. This is a period in which Soviet agriculture is brought to its knees um, by the Nazi invasion in the West um, and by the fact that the vast majority of kind of working age people are conscripted into the Red Army in some form, either directly on the front or trying to support um, the kind of massive mobilization that was necessary within the Soviet Union. So there's a crisis of calories all across the Soviet Union, and there's a particularly acute crisis of fat calories. And so the kind of director of the Far Eastern Fleet, um, who's working in the, in the Pacific, writes a letter to Stalin um, in the early 40s and says, I have an answer to our fat problem, and it is whales. We need a whaling fleet, and we need to kind of really be able to embrace the fact that we have access to the Pacific Ocean and then potentially to Antarctica. And during the course of the war, they actually inherit a German whaling fleet um, as kind of one of the spoils, and they start really kind of moving into the industrial whaling space. I'm now gonna collapse months of work in I think the coldest archive in the world into kind of a brief paragraph. In order to explain why the Soviet Union keeps whaling even after they don't need the fat. There's kind of this brief moment right around the Second World War where the absolute human emergency of feeding people kind of made sense to have a whaling program um, and to try to be quite aggressive with it. But that has really dissipated by the early 1950s when Soviet agriculture is back online. And yet the Soviet whaling program will continue to whale for the next 20 years and continue to whale at an absolutely gargantuan level and whale far outside the limits that are imposed by the International Whaling Commission. So why are they killing the whales? Part of the reason seems to go back to a kind of fundamental issue that the Marxist-Leninist project has within the Soviet Union, which is Marx left extraordinarily detailed and crisp descriptions of the evils of capitalism, right? He gave the project, the Soviet project, its kind of moral force of saying this is going to be a state that overcomes the kind of extraordinarily alienation of people from the work that they do, of people from each other, the human misery that capitalism causes through its gross inequities, the lack of freedom that comes with it. These things are all very carefully described in Marx and are things that were very much kind of woven into the heart of the Soviet project. What Marx did not leave for Lenin and Stalin after him was a clear sense of what socialism let alone kind of fully formed cap or communism would look like. How do you know that you've actually made a communist world in practice? And over the 1930s and 1940s and then into the 50s, there starts to be this kind of slippage within the way that the Soviet Union talks about the development and the arrival of the Marxist kind of utopia that everyone is supposed to be striving for. And it starts to emphasize that one of the things that Marx promised was a world of true material plenty for everyone. It was a, a world so without lack that there wouldn't have to be any political disagreement. There wouldn't have to be people doing jobs that they hated. It was truly kind of a, a utopia of plenty. And one way to sort of clock that the utopia was becoming more plentiful was to count up everything you produced every year. And the Soviet Union was very good at doing this. Whether or not the numbers are accurate is a totally different question, but the obsession with counting is absolutely real to anyone who's ever touched a Soviet archive. The numbers are just leaping out at you all the time. And they're trying to prove that this year we produced more than last year, and because we've produced more than last year, that is a tangible material sign that we are making the Marxist utopia more present. It's going to be real because we are actually materializing it on the ground. This leaves the Soviet Union to really emphasize expanding plans. So every year, Gosplan, which is sort of the central planning agency in Moscow, would hand down a series of plans to its regional uh, kind of affiliates, to its different uh, sectors, so the fishing or the people who made tractors, the folks who produced shoes. Everyone had a target for how much 
um, they were supposed to produce. It was very bad if you did not meet the plan, not a good thing. It was good if you met the plan, and it was extremely good if you exceeded the plan. So if the plan said you should kill 421 humpback whales and you went out and killed 492 humpback whales, you could come home and be a hero of socialist labor, um, you would get a big pay raise, and you would also get to participate in the actual realization of this ideological project. And what this does, um, as these kind of samples from Soviet logbooks show, is it produced a very similar emphasis on quantifying whales as opposed to qualifying them. So the Soviet archives are an absolutely kind of bizarre and impenetrable fuzz of numbers about the different ways that you can divide up a whale so that it meets the plan. You can turn it into fertilizer, you can turn it into the kind of fat that's used in cosmetics, you can turn it into the kind of fat that's used in surgical procedures, you can turn it into vitamins that people are able to eat, all sorts of different ways of subdividing a whale. But at the end of the day, it's a deeply quantitative obsession. And this is not to say that Soviet whalers were any less um, kind of practically and personally involved in observing the ways in which whales acted when they killed them. They leave in their own memoirs and their own logbooks a similar set of observations. Um, first of all, about the ways in which whale behavior changes as soon as a whale uh, group or a particular location becomes used to the presence of the Soviet whale ships. The whales become harder to kill. They learn different evasive procedures. They try to get around the whalers. And the Soviets are actually quite adept at um, observing the communicative um, behavior of whales um, and are far ahead of their colleagues in the West in terms of talking about the whales in which, way in which whales use song and other oral communication uh, to pass information between each other. So you can take what you want to from the fact that a communist country paid more attention to the communal lives of whales than a capitalist one did for a long time. But it's certainly, you know, Soviet marine biology was very aware of what was happening to whales. And many of the whalers were as well. Um, one of them would later recall that he was thankful that the whales couldn't scream because if they had been able to make noise on the decks, his, his job would have been essentially impossible. So that same sense of kind of carrying a moral wound, some sort of ethical injury because of the work also underlies some of what Soviet whalers talk about in their own experience. But also much like the capitalist whalers that came before them, there was not any real official way to make that experience legible to people uh, more generally, generally, the people at Gosplan, uh, the folks who were setting the, the plan targets year after year. Um, and even when marine biologists would go to Gosplan and say, we are killing so many whales that we are going to eradicate humpbacks in this particular location, or the sperm whales are getting smaller every year, usually those reports were stamped top secret and shoved off into the coldest archive in the world where I found them. So at some level of abstraction, socialist and capitalist whaling have two kind of big things in common. One is that the whalers themselves did not operate in a world that let them respond to the experience and the information that they were sort of taking from whaling itself. The values that they served were set by very distant people, people in Boston, people in Moscow, Consumers who had no sense of the experience of whaling, of the behavior of whales, of anything that was emerging in that interaction on the waves. And I would hardly be the first historian to diagnose um, the problem of turning things into commodities, of commodifying the world. Um, but in the case of whaling, there's a particularly profound separation between production and consumption. And within that kind of a denial of the labor and the knowledge that came out of the labor of whaling, um, and knowledge about whales both. So officially, the experience that, that the people doing the whaling were undertaking was very much diminished, and knowledge about whales was eradicated from the actual kind of consumed products. One way of talking about this would be to call it alienated labor or dehumanized labor, but in some ways it's even more than that because it's labor that also strips uh, people's experience of recognizing a non-human world around them, 
in more general terms. Secondly, both the United States and the Soviet Union were killing whales in order to feed dreams of essentially endless growth. They both clocked the sort of health and security of their societies um, by imagining a sort of human future, a, a particular trajectory of history um, that was kind of an endless line just growing off into the horizon, ever upward and upward and upward, and increasingly less bound by the cycles of birth and death that are necessary parts of being a biological organism on Earth. And these are both very teleological visions that see people as uniquely possessed of the ability to make history and the history that they're making being one of increasing freedom and particularly freedom from the whims of the natural world around them. The fact that that kind of line of production that kept growing and growing and growing is actually fed by death originally, that it emerges out of entropic acts, um, acts that killed through entire oceans and probably over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries through about four million whales, robbed the world not just of the work that whales do and not just whales of each other and their own social worlds, but robbed the kind of larger community of beings on the planet of the, the sort of ecosystem work that whales perform. And it made whaling like dozens of other economic activities where the, that are based kind of on death first and foremost, but that death is made invisible at the last to the people who end up consuming it. So enter Paul Watson. We've now done our three groups of whalers. You pick communist, capitalist, now for our one group of environmentalists. So Paul Watson is a very early member of Greenpeace, and Greenpeace is an organization that starts off as an anti-nuclear uh, kind of protest group, but turns to thinking about whales when it learns that both the United States and the Soviet Union used oil derived from sperm whales to lubricate intercontinental ballistic missiles. So Greenpeace realizes that the fate of many whale species and the face of human beings are actually kind of intertwined in a pretty intimate way. Um, and at this point, turn to trying to prevent uh, whaling. This is in the 1970s. And at this point, basically all the world's whaling fleets other than the Soviet Union and to some extent the Japanese have given up uh, large scale industrial whaling. And so it's mostly Soviet whaling ships that Greenpeace goes after. And they, in particular, try to interrupt Soviet whaling when they're working just off of uh, kind of territorial waters um, of the United States because they would get information about the location of whaling ships from the Department of Defense, which is interesting if you're an you know, anti-nuclear organization. But the DOD figured that the Soviet Union must be conducting some sort of spying activity with their whaling fleets and so wanted to keep track of what was going on and try to drive them off the coast of the US. And Watson was a, a deeply committed member of Greenpeace and as I said at the beginning, would go out and put his body between the, the sort of Soviet harpoons, those massive harpoons you saw in the previous slide and the whales themselves. So it was risky work um, and would do it over and over again, and was doing it in large part to actually expose the fact that the consumption of whales was based on their dying. He was trying to make visible that kind of invisibility that had been imposed on the production chain and actually show the world um, that Soviet whaling was really rooted in the deaths of these animals. And in many ways, this is a very necessary function. By the time the Greenpeace activists took to the oceans, this way of harvesting whales with these big industrial fleets was actually the dominant relationship between humans and cetaceans on the global oceans. And Watson and the other folks in Greenpeace wanted to assert that whales had value while they were still alive by making their deaths public and showing kind of how terrible they were, showing that moral wound that emerges when you kill one of these animals. But Watson ends up splitting from Greenpeace in part because he wants to go a step further, not just stop the industrial killing of whales, but to stop the killing of whales anywhere at any time for any reason. Which brings us back to St. Lawrence Island in the summer of 2017. And if I liked Paul Watson a little bit better, 
And if he was not in the business of sending death threats uh, to teenagers that I know, I would here offer a formal apology for the fact that I'm about to make him stand in for an entire worldview, which is a little unfair. And yet, I'm about to do it. And this is because, to me, the politics of Watson's attack on a passing gawk and upon other indigenous whalers is really just the inverted politics of industrial production. If industry could only possibly value whales when they are dead, then Watson's answer is to only ever value them when they're alive. And in many ways, it is another argument renouncing the human participation in any kind of death anywhere. Not the denial of entropy through endless invisible consumption, but the denial of death of whales for any purpose. And it is a vision that retains a very strict separation between people and the rest of the world, making Watson an inheritor of practices of ignoring death, either by separating consumption from production in the first place, or by imagining that we are somehow above consuming at all, which is another way of imagining that people live in a state of exemption from the rest of nature, that we have some particular kind of agency that grants us enormous freedom, and first and foremost, a freedom to create our ethics alone out of the world without taking in any influence from the behavior of any other being around us. But to live in the Arctic as I have is to understand the real inevitability of death and the things that curtail our freedoms. To rise on an Arctic morning and walk out into the world is to understand that you might not walk back in the particular bodily form that you got out of bed in, partly because you're just not at the top of the food chain there, even with a 30-06 rifle and very good aim. To walk out in the morning is to understand your personal dependence on the person's around you, either human persons or non-human persons, and the decisions that they are going to make of you in the course of the day. Perhaps I will be their food, or perhaps they will be mine. And it is also a world where to participate in death, as those photos from St. Lawrence Island of the whale bones make so clear, or this whale skeleton from Chukotka, is that you cannot retreat from the kind of necessity of consuming particularly animals around you. It is a place where being a vegetarian is essentially impossible because there are not enough plants to eat. So if you want to be a person in the world, something at some point has to die. But in this particular time we live in, in the, the Anthropocene moment that we inhabit, even here in Boston, and even with a life that you can live without touching animal flesh in any form, not to wear, not to eat, you have not actually accepted yourself from something somewhere dying. Many somethings. Even now that nobody in this room wears lipstick that was made out of a whale or eats whale margarine, our habits of consumption are still very directly killing them. In the case of those of us here in Boston, the population of Atlantic right whales that live right off the coast from us are going extinct in very real time. Their population is now under 400 animals and they are dying pretty directly from human consumption, either because they get tangled in lobster pots or because they get hit by the propellers of the boats that are increasingly filling their waterways and that they're unable to avoid. And other species of whales, from gray whales that have been experiencing a mass mortality event all across the western coast of the United States and Canada, um, to the sperm whales that beach themselves um, and apparently, for in some cases, because their stomachs are so filled with plastic rather than food that they are driving themselves crazy and might in fact be suiciding on the beaches in order to sort of avoid the torment of not being able to eat, our own kind of habits of consumption remain deeply enmeshed with these species. And that means that in some sense, those of us in this room, um, no matter how much we want to renounce it, have lives that are participating in extinctions, both at mass levels and in levels of species that we can actually observe in real time. And to me, in many ways, this mocks Paul Watson's desire for some sort of purity and withdrawal where you can simply identify one species or group of species and care for them alone in isolation from the broader world we inhabit. For there really is no option of retreat of pure withdrawal from consuming the world around us. 
all of us beings that do not photosynthesize, so everybody in this room, because I don't see any plants here, must consume something. We do not make the energy that we need in order to live. We only rework it, and we put it into new forms. Which means that what is left for us to do is figure out not how not to consume, but how to actually consume well. And one of the many intellectual challenges of the Anthropocene, to my mind, is figuring out or learning how to articulate an ethics that puts that dependency first and foremost. Not that we can rise above the world that we need, but rather that we depend upon it so intimately that we have to figure out relationships of consumption that are not simply ones of extraction. And now for my very speculative close, which is short. One way of reading the history of humans in Wales for the last 2,000 years is a history in which whales have actually intimated the way in which they wish to be consumed. If we take seriously the understanding of bowhead whales that Yupik people still hold and participate in actively, and these are the whalers that know them best and have known bowhead whales very intimately since before Christianity was a religion, then the history says something like this. We see animals that have done their very best to reject in every power that they have access to certain kinds of relationships with people. They have rejected capitalist whaling by trying to adapt their behaviors, and they similarly attempted to do so in relationship to Soviet whaling ships. But they also do not appear to have completely rejected trying to die for people occasionally. So to speculate wildly, in the case of bowhead whales, and it's quite specific to the ecosystem, it's not a completely transferable set of observations, the whales themselves have offered an argument for the kind of relationship that they would prefer. It is a relationship where humans remain dependent on whales, and it's also a relationship in which there is true and recognized interdependence um, and a set of ethics around the act of killing that put limits on its sheer size and scale. And I think that for historians, um, and for those of us who think about ethics in the past, the more kind of transferable observations from this particular study is that labor that reduces the world only to tallied commodities, whether or not that tally is for capitalist purposes or for an industrial Soviet socialist sort, is a world that impoverishes a society's moral imagination. It strips the workers who participate in the labor of producing the raw stuff that we require of the capacity to react to the world that they are working up. And it is blind not just to the death necessity to sustain life, but also to the wills, the emotions, and even the ethical judgments of other living beings. Thank you. all hear me up in the back? Okay. We're okay? Thank you. Um, oh, we just got a lot louder. <laughs> Power's on. Uh, the, the power is on, right. Uh, how do we consume well the role of affect in the writing of history and our comprehension of the past, our ability to inhabit the worlds of those who are long gone or far away, this question of the moral wound and the evocation of an intelligent social species other than human that thinks, responds with agentive force and foresight to our actions, making its own sorts of moral decisions, is a really wonderfully rich Thank you. talk. Thank you very much. What we're going to do is open the floor for questions uh, and comments from the audience. I will ask and insist, indeed, uh, that you let us know who you are. <laughs> Tell Bathsheba your name, uh, some other aspect of, uh, of uh, you know, relevant aspect of your life. That is, your, if you're a student of a particular <laughs> program at the university, let us know, let Bathsheba know, um, and then proceed to the question. I want to shamelessly exploit the prerogative of chair uh, to start uh, with my own question. 
Um, and it, it's selfishly about my own work, which is on the history of energy. So right now I'm working on, on energy in very different contexts. And that's what I find so striking here is the trans, the ways that the metaphor of energy as a kind of master metaphor for thinking with, thinking through the ecosystem and social system that you've described for us works and uh, perhaps does not. And that's ultimately mm -hmm. the question. I'm struck by the crisis of calories in UPIC societies and in mass-oriented, mass-organized, uh, numerically obsessed <laughs> socialist economies, uh, the, the coldest archive in the world that is filled with numbers that nobody reads anymore. Um, the use of fossil fuels, coal, uh, and uh, hydrocarbons to fuel the factory ships that are uh, destroying the ecosystems uh, about which you speak, and then the utility of energy as a master metaphor for the science of ecology itself. From the Odoms, mm -hmm. uh, before the Odoms, and of course moving through the Odoms in the post-World War yeah. II moment into the present, we don't speak of anything other than energy when we talk about ecology most often. Mm -hmm. There are other ways to do that work, but in general the term itself uh, allows us to talk about ecosystems. And so I just wanted to ask you about bringing that master metaphor into this setting. How did you, you begin to work with it? It's striking. One of the great contributions of the book is your use of the term. And where did you find the edges? What doesn't mm -hmm. energy do? Yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, so I came to using energy quite accidentally, which I think is often true of historical projects. Um, I had been reading Arctic ecology while I was doing my preparatory work as a graduate student. And so I had a sense that um, ecosystems in the Arctic look a little bit different than ones down here in the temperate climates where um, the ocean and the land are about roughly able to produce life at the same scale. They absorb the same amount of sunlight as turned into calories through photosynthesis roughly on land and sea, whereas in the Arctic, the oceans are extraordinarily biologically productive. They're some of the richest ecosystems in the world in terms of their capacity to fix sunlight. Um, but by the time you get up onto the high tundra, that's much, much diminished, which is why you, you know, so can't have agriculture. It's not a place that's ever gonna have, well, I shouldn't say ever, it has not historically had amber waves of grain. Um, and so I knew that there was essentially this kind of energy geography in the Arctic where the oceans are very rich and then it kind of bubbles out onto the coasts but becomes less so when you get out onto the, the land. And then as I was doing the research for this book um, and I was well into it, I had been in many archives, I realized that what I was seeing was the, um, the kind of temporal pattern of foreign influence. So Russian imperial, American whalers, folks like that coming into the Arctic, they came first for where the energy was most dense. They start with whaling, they move out to hunting walruses on the coasts, and they eventually get out onto the tundra and try to find various ways of living in that space. And so the kind of temporal pattern of colonization um, followed in time the way that energy looks in space. And then I realized I should probably take energy seriously. Um, because it seemed to be a motivating factor for these two kind of ideological systems that I was, that I had gone to the archives originally to talk about, which were socialism and capitalism. Um, so in many ways, I, I came to it rather naively. It wasn't out of a deep reading of the energy humanities um, or something like that that I sort of had to retroactively do. But I found it useful as a way of trying to imagine a history in which people have to be embedded in the ecosystems that they're operating in rather than skimming above it. And to me, this is, it's partly an analytical question of how to do that, how to kind of re-articulate people not as these entirely separate autonomous beings, but as participant in a set of ecosystem relationships, which, you know, energy exchange is, you know, in some ways it's the easiest way to do that. I'm not sure it's the best, um, but it was available. Um, but I think it also comes from my ongoing and still quite frustrated attempt to try to find a kind of materialism that's not reductive, but is instead able to kind of create sets of linkages between all sorts of beings and processes in a place. And I, I don't know if it's what I will stick with um, as I change projects, because um, I think there is a way that it can be too reductive um, and that it it flattens the kind of complexity and uniqueness of different kinds of life. 
and I am dissatisfied with that. Um, I basically try to write my way around that problem, um, <laughs> but that's not, a, that's not an analytical position, right? That's a rhetorical one. Um, so I, it's a problem I'm still turning over. Um, well, I, I, I think you've handled it elegantly in the book. I mean, the, and I do think the narrative toolbox is the one that you've, you've really used it beautifully because you do write your way around it and you bring your reader into that problem without reducing it, without mm -hmm. flattening it, um, which I, I wanted you. to uh, say also came through so clearly in the talk with the question of the moral wound and so on. And with that as an invitation, I'd like to open the floor to comments and questions. What I will do is move through the room and kind of collect folks as we go. And again, uh, please do tell us who you are. We'll come here and then move up to the left. And then I, I promise I will move uh, adroitly and uh, across the, the, the spectrum. Mm -hmm. oh. I'm Rob Cheney. I'm the science journalism fellow with the Neiman Foundation and really appreciated your insights. Do we have a responsibility to have relationships with all creatures or is there some between the, the treating every blade of grass as a sentient being and a 200 year old whale, is there some level that we ought to concentrate on? And secondly, how does a largely urbanized population that is never going to have an experience <laughs> like this gain that kind of relationship? Those are both great questions and, you know, so small and easy to summarize in <laughs> quick <laughs> offhand remarks. Um, I think one of the things that living in the Arctic and, and living with folks who have, you know, a, a deep, you know, millennia long attachment to the place has taught me to be suspect in my own instinct is to be suspect of the tendency to make a hierarchy of beings in the world based on their intelligence. And in many ways, I just participated in that because I gave you a beautiful, you know, lecture about, or not a beautiful lecture, a letter, lecture about beautiful megafauna, right, who happen to be extremely intelligent um, and so are the easiest in some ways for people to uh, grasp onto as analogs of ourselves um, and offer them protection. And I think one of the things I find most striking about spending time in the Arctic is being around people for whom that particular hierarchy isn't the operational one. Um, and instead, there's a particular kind of moral re relationship that you have with whales, but you also have moral relationships with other sorts of beings, which doesn't mean that you don't consume them or you don't sometimes destroy them because you need a campfire or you need to build a cabin or do something like that, but it also means that there's an expectation of moral relevance even with the things that aren't quite as sentient. How to turn that into practice is complicated. <laughs> um, and I think it's particularly complicated, as you intimated, in a place like we live in here where sort of in a practical sense, my access to having the kind of moral relationships that I might have learned how to have in the Arctic are cut off, right? Um, they're not actually practically you know, applicable to know where all my food even comes from, right? Let alone where the energy in this room is produced or the wood that is paneling the room comes from, or you know, those relationships are so commodified and so distanced, it's really hard to do that. Um, I think to me, the thing that I find striking is the idea that you could think about an ethics that comes from a particular place and what the, what the life in that place is actually able to provide and under what conditions it flourishes. So it's not going to be an identical set of relationships as you pick people have with bowhead whales because we're not eating bowhead whales and you know we, we participate and exist in a very different uh, context. It's a different kind of ecosystem. It can produce different things. Um, and we can either, you know, participate in, in ways that allow for a variety of kinds of life to flourish or really allow for just human life to flourish. And that's very mushy and not very specific, but that's kind of where I am at in terms of thinking about it. Thank you very much. So we'll come here and please do signal and I'll, I'll note uh, locations in the room uh, to come to after after Will. Will, please uh, tell us who you are. 
Following up on Robert's question, which is about the moral wound, among animals, humans kill is other humans, and certainly that has a moral life that we don't just accept but try and manage either to get people to kill or not to kill. And so I was wondering about what strategies the whalers or anti-whaling activists had for managing or trying to actually produce this um, to make people feel or not feel. And then if there's anything for us there that we might, you know, per his urban residence, might try and use ourselves. Yeah, I think um, if you go look at uh, Greenpeace's website, they have a really terrific archive, actually, and much of it is footage from these uh, these kind of initial contacts between the Greenpeace ships and um, the Soviet whalers. And it's very clear that part of what they're trying to do is expose... Um, expose the cost at a kind of a whale level. Greenpeace wasn't particularly interested in the the kind of moral wound of Soviet whalers, in part because they they never spoke with them, right? They didn't they did not share a language, and you know the capacity to to talk across the Cold War boundary was not there. Um, so it, it's not that they didn't necessarily have a desire to do that, but they didn't have the practical access to it. Um, but it was certainly effective in the sense that Greenpeace was part of this sort of wider movement around protesting industrial whaling, um, making it visible to consumers that, you know, the sort of costs of whaling were quite real. Um, and, you know, in some ways, you know, provoked very mild boycotts, um, partly mild because American consumers didn't actually consume very much whale. Um, it ended up in dog food in the U.S. and it ended up in the transmissions of some cars. Um, but it wasn't a major part of kind of American public life. It was far more so in the Soviet Union where people were not, you know, seeing Greenpeace advertisements. Um, but I do think that there's a, there's a similar kind of um, ethic at the center of the way in which animal rights activists now try to get footage from within factory farms um, and from within kind of confinement operations to show people kind of the moral... Uh, harm that is done to animals. Um, but I think one way in which this history could kind of broaden out that attempt is to show that it's not just harmful to the animals, it's harmful to the people who are involved in the process too. And it is profoundly kind of cutting off the experience of people who work in any kind of factory farm. And I'm from Iowa, so I, you know, I'm around them sometimes. Um, their sense of moral harm um, from working in those conditions is very high. And I think that, you know, a, a version of thinking about what we eat as needing to include not just the animal or the plant, but also the labor of the person who brings the animal and the plant to the table, literally, um, would do something to reduce that wound, right? Nobody chooses to work in a confinement facility and to kill animals under those conditions. They're truly horrible. Um, and so making those visible and then also kind of allowing the narratives of those people to actually escape the prison of quantification and actually live in kind of a qualitative way, um, I would hope would help, right? I hope that we all have the moral imagination if we're confronted with that to react to it. Escaping the prison of quantification and living in a, a, a moral manner sounds like an argument for the humanities to me. So that's that's wonderful. Uh, also, the extension of moral care and consideration to the non-human world becoming it, through a kind of reciprocity that you described so elegantly, an act of humanization mm -hmm. uh, that is powerfully political in this world of ours is crucial. I'd like to uh, come back to uh, um, the very back row here. Um, yes. Thanks so much, and uh, I really appreciate, especially those last points about the moral wound. It's a really striking uh, dimension of your talk. Uh, you present us with a dilemma, and you know you're very brave to try to lead us somewhere out of it. It's an enormous, enormous problem, and I don't want to take away from the goodness of your work, but I, I, I just want to take the liberty to speak for a second on behalf of the whales. It, the, the mythology of the whales consenting to be killed works, in a, I think, in a very particular way in the Yupik society, in a very particular context, which is no longer 
obtaining now to, to have part of our solution that whales are going to consent, you know, even just a few of them, it, it, that really stood out for me as yet one more thing. That's very hard to buy. Could you tell us your yeah. name, ma'am? Oh, sorry. Uh, Janet Gatto, and I teach at Harvard Divinity School. I'm actually a person in Buddhist studies, but uh, I'm actually working on a book on animal ethics as well right Thank now. you, Janet. I thought that was you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and in some ways, um, you know, I'm not asking you to, to buy the idea that the whales consent. I think the, the idea that I find most provocative in this is that the hunting ethics that emerge um, on St. Lawrence Island and all around the Bering Strait emerge not simply from people talking to each other, but they come from people taking very seriously the behaviors of the world around them, right? And I think that in an ecosystem like the one we live in here, you would come up with a very different set of behaviors because they're pretty specific to living in the Arctic and subarctic. They're not, you know, they're not actually transferable in that sense. Um, and so in many ways, I'm using that as a provocation, right, to say that we need an ethics that can think outside of the human, and there actually are ethical practices that are very old and very established and actually have very real consequence in the way that people interact with animals that are out there, right? I would push back, though, on the idea that the Yupik do not still continue to practice those things um, because that, I mean, that idea of indigenous discontinuance and erasure is, it has a set of ideological problems that mostly come from a desire for a settler colonial state to make peace with its presence um, by absenting the very real continued moral valiance of these folks. And in fact, to er erase their knowledge practices, right? And to say somehow they are lesser or they have disappeared. And I would be very careful about that because I think that um, there is a real force in the way that people have maintained a relationship with animals on which they understand themselves as depending. Yeah, as a scholar of Japan, that what, what is most striking about the talk is the fact that the nation state that I study and that I, where I'm focused uh, with most of my time and attention has strove to inhabit this space, mm -hmm. claiming a set of indigenous nationalized practices right. as justification for the industrialized slaughter of, of these very same species and very same animals, um, which is a striking inversion of right. the same dynamic and I think resonates with some of the questions that interest Janet in her current work. Yeah. So we will come uh, to the young woman uh, at the very back in the right and um, then to the gentleman uh, next to her. And please, again, give us your name, let us know who you are. Right. Um, hi, my name is Chloe Rose Colombero. Um, it's very, very cool to hear you talk. <laughs> um, I have two things to say, and the first is thank you, because we cannot have what we cannot imagine. And it is so wonderful that your work is imagining new ways to exist on the earth um, outside of the one in which we're kind of forced and pressed to exist. So thank you for doing that work. Um, and my second is a question, but I wrote it down because I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, and so in your talk, there was this eerie similarity between the extractive drivers of capitalism, the desire for boundless growth separated from death and birth, and then the Soviet whalers seeking out a state of plenty. And when you talked about the Soviet whaler, um, whalers being heroes of socialist labor through higher and higher, more exterminative catches, um, I was hoping to ask you if you'd found any sort of argument within that for some sort of like historically contingent parallel of experience or confounding of experience with not only the capitalist but with also the Uvic in terms of the Soviet whaler getting to become a whole person transformed by the death of the whale at their hands um, and kind of the confounding of consumption through death as the whale here being um, considered a vehicle for a higher attainment. Thank you, that's a really beautiful question um, and beautifully put. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually think that, you know, the, the Soviet whalers whose experience I have access to vary. Um, I think for some folks, it really was a, um, 
there was a way in which being a whaler, and particularly because whales are large animals, and so even with a great deal of technology, to kill one is a communal thing. And so if you're in a society that values communal work, um, it is it kind of lends itself to a certain kind of Soviet valorization just to begin with. And that one whaler wrote in, in his memoir, he said, well, you know, of course we kept whaling because on the whale ships there was communism. Like, I got, you know, back on land and things weren't necessarily going so great. But out there, like, we were actually communist. The only place I could really say that I had achieved it was when I wasn't actually in the Soviet Union physically. Um, I was out at sea. Um, and so I think within that, there is a, there is a sense of kind of attaining whole personhood um, that, you know, the language would be very different and the kind of terms of it would be would be different in the Soviet case, but, um, and I think that goes to how core, and the, the Soviet Union was very aware of this, doing work for others is to the human experience, right? That, you know, Soviet, or sorry, historians are loath to uh, make sweeping generalizations about anything, but I think most of us feel better when our work feels like it is meaningful and serving a, a broader collective, and that the whaling ships could provide that. Okay. The gentleman uh, here, yeah. Yes, my name is uh, Ava Shmuel, and I'm a teacher here in Cambridge. Um, first, I want to say that uh, the, the people you're talking about, we call them indigenous people, and they're um, killing the whale because that's their way of life, that's their sustenance. They don't waste any part of the whale. And, and the whale is, is indeed their source uh, of, of uh, nourishment. So then the question is, and other people have talked about a greater sense of morality. At first I was, I was, going, to, uh, I was going to object to the idea that the whale uh, was uh, on some levels or in some instances ready to be killed. I don't believe that at all. But then I think really the whole question bounces back to the human sensitivity. I think we have to decide which animals are okay to kill from a moral point of view and which animals are not allowed to be killed just to make a buck. Mm -hmm. so, but that requires an act of discussion. And as we go ahead into the 21st century, we're going to have to confront that because it's a global world now. So I think <laughs> maybe your, the efficacy of your talk is to make us all realize that, there, that we haven't found the answer. The answer is yet to be discovered, but it's time to get going on it. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, I. that is a very nice rearticulation of of the point that I'm trying to make, which is not that we can, in a, some one-to-one -one sense, grasp onto what Yupik folks do and transmute it here and turn it into just an excuse for killing animals, um, but rather that it is a provocation for rethinking the fact that consumption is political, right? And we should be talking about what it's like. And we should, in fact, be demanding better options for doing it. Because one of the things that I came away from this research feeling is that our my capacities for moral action have been so circumscribed by the world in which I'm allowed to consume, right? Partly because, you know, for example, fossil fuel companies would prefer that I not think about my consumption of those goods being optional. Um, and that, that, that is just politics, right? It, we, don't get, we don't get free lunch. <laughs> um, we have to sort of have these really enmeshed gnarly discussions about things. And some of that is about what animals we eat or decide not to eat, or there might be places in the world where you eat none at all, um, and that that is the righteous thing to do, um, and that it might be specific to place and to people, um, but that it, it really does have to be hashed out. Thank you. It's wonderful, and the movement from the moral and ethical considerations that you bring to mind and bring to bear around the question of the non-human animal, then in the text itself, you expand those to consider what it means to consume fossil fuels and to work in within the machinery of industrial modernity. And that, uh, to borrow from Donna Haraway, this notion of staying with the trouble. <laughs> that these questions remain and must remain, at least in this given moment, unresolved and unresolvable, um, is striking and palpable running through the narrative. And that commonality from 
this moment to that motor and <laughs> yeah. expanded right. outward is, is really striking, which is all a way to uh, talk about the movement of time and, and so on. Uh, what we will do, the gentleman here uh, in the back, and then we'll move to, um, that's a lovely sweater, uh, so we'll move <laughs> to the beautiful sweater there. And, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Will Julian. I'm a first year in East Asian Languages and Civilizations. Um, sort of as a follow-up to that, I think most of us here completely agree, and I was really moved by like the vast majority um, of this talk. And I think the title in particular was very evocative to me of like Elizabeth Pavanelli's Do Rocks Listen, um, Julie Cruikshank's Do Glaciers Listen, mm -hmm. um, which are wonderful yes, works and, and force us to really confront our own values from the perspective of others and the way that others practice. Um, but the thing that really seemed so different to me about this talk was that the subject is different in some way, at least for us. Um, and I'm just curious to know if, if I was interpreting or understanding the way you closed the talk correctly, um, which was to say that because this is an admittedly a very sensitive and sensible practice given a context, um, that therefore the sensible thing for us as outside observers to do is to um, abstain from making a, any form of um, judgment or intervention. And I'm just curious to know if certain studies in biology continue to progress to the point at which we can map a language or actually start to articulate um, for ourselves what whale, certain whale species are communicating or how they're communicating and maybe in some ways, um, sperm whales or uh, other whale species have more advanced, whatever that means, um, very sophisticated ways of experiencing emotionally the world that maybe we don't even have access to. Is there ever a point for you at which you would change what I think you closed with, which was to say that this is okay because they're doing it and it's been done in this very sensible way historically? I mean, in some ways, I think that's, that goes back to this sort of uh, gnarly political question that societies have to make, that those aren't individual choices, right? Societies have to decide and, and hash those things out. Um, in the case of, of Yupik whaling and more generally Arctic indigenous people's relationships with the, the world that they live in and how they um, understand it, um, I am completely disinterested in getting into the business that has been very much a part of the last, you know, hundred years there of coming in from the outside with a set of what seem like moral absolutes and scientific certainties and making a set of judgments about people's behavior because those have been extraordinarily destructive to human life in these communities and they're deeply enmeshed in the colonial state. Um, and I think what's most provocative to me about uh, Yupik practice is that Yupik hunters understand that killing a whale is an enormous moral act, right? It's not a small thing. Um, you know, when Chris Apassenglock put it on Facebook, it was to say to his friends and family who don't all live in Gamble that, you know, I have meat for you now. It's not boasting, you don't boast. It's, it's sort of a very kind of controlled thing. And I think in part because there is also that sense of moral wound even within this society, right? It's just one that's able to acknowledge for its hunters that this is part of the practice. And there are other indigenous societies that are considering whether or not you know, hunting practices need to change or diminish or go away because of climate change or other population pressures. So it is, you know, it's a flexible worldview like any worldview. Um, I'm not particularly interested as an outsider in going in and pushing the flex in any particular direction because that is very much a piece of a kind of colonial politics. Um, I think the question of at what point do you say that an animal is you know, kind of beyond killing. In some ways, I want to invert the question and say, why is it only intelligence that would make us wonder about our moral responsibilities and actions? Um, because I think one of the other really complicated things about living in the Arctic is that you can't imagine that there's any sort of consumption where you're not really inveighing on the ecosystem that you're within, right? There, you mostly have to eat animals, so you're mostly kind of participant in that. Um, but if you think about what we're learning about plants, like where do you draw the line 
you know, if, if it feels pain, you know, like it's, um, so I think that in some ways creating a hierarchy of sentience or intelligence is an easy out from the, the kind of moral work of trying to imagine yourself as just deeply implicated in the business of consumption. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Anna. I'm a first year PhD student in the history of science department. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your methodological approach to working with indigenous communities and kind of developing a decolonial understanding of whales and whaling. Thank you, that's a great question. Um, I think that my approach to this has been, it was first and foremost informed because when I moved to the Arctic at 18, I was living in a majority indigenous community. And by majority, I mean like there were three of us white folks in town. Um, and in many ways was taught to see the world because I was 18 and you absorb everything like a sponge, um, very much in the way that my host family understood it operating, right? Which is a far more kind of wild, animate, um, inhabited world than the one that I grew up in in Iowa. And I didn't even really know that that's what I was learning until I was in grad school and started being a little bit more reflexive about it. Um, but what that taught me very clearly was that the knowledge traditions within these communities are as rich and varied and in need of sort of foregrounding as any other knowledge tradition. Um, and that particularly in this place, those are the traditions that have the longest history. So in some ways, my method is an extraordinarily conservative one, which is that I go to the sources that are the oldest and have the kind of longest tradition of inhabitants um, and foreground those, um, uh, you know, and put them quite on par with the sources that come from the more traditional archive of the, you know, cold Soviet sort or the, you know, American bureaucracy or something like that. Um, so in some ways it's, it's just to, um, treat them as complete equals in in kind of having a moral imagination, a set of ideas about the future, a tradition of history. Um, and then in the book itself, I took some kind of formal techniques that are present in most Arctic um, indigenous storytelling practices, um, one of which is to tell events from mul multiple perspectives uh, within the same narrative and essentially leave it up to the listener to make a decision about which of those things is the most accurate or true. Um, and then the listener becomes the teller eventually and will, in the process of retelling it, uh, pass on what they think is the most useful. So there are events in the book where I give multiple versions of the same thing and I, I don't, as the historian, weigh in on which one is true. Um, I sort of leave it to the, the reader. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of a dialogic practice that, that comes very much out of that tradition. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we'll come down to the front to Robin Kelsey. No, no, actually. Oh, okay. All right. All the way over to the left. I promised we would go to the middle. We'll come back. Um, but uh, here in the center, um, uh, what do we call these? I don't know, tier. <laughs> Such an odd room. Thank you all for your patience with the room. It's, I think it's a model UN. Hi, um, my name is Salty, and I'm uh, I'm here because I'm the artist in residence of UMass Dartmouth's art faculty, and I'm trying to plan a collaborative art project about whales and whaling history in New Bedford. Oh, um, so thanks so much for your talk and your work. Um, I'm curious, actually, about. Uh, whether you think there is a difference between your academic and personal relationship to whales, and if so, what and how? That's a really good question, and I've never thought about it. You know, personal, Which like when you're lying in bed at night and yeah, you're not standing in front of everyone and have to give a talk. <laughs> and not like performing. Um, I would say that there's there's a kind of personal experience that is badly captured in in the kind of strictures of academic anything, um, and that goes for whales and it goes for caribou or you know it goes for living in a particular place, um, because uh, 
very importantly and necessarily academic work is about making arguments and trying to kind of assemble a sensible way of interpreting and understanding the world. And then there is the kind of world of experience that doesn't always make any sense um, in a narrative way or in an argumentative way, right? It's, it's far more immediate and kind of phenomenological rather than, um, you know, making an argument about what socialists do and what capitalists do. Um, so I think that there's a way of thinking about whales just as beings that you experience in the environment that, you know, it, it certainly informs my work in the sense that it gives me a way of describing them and, you know, a, imagining what they look like and things like that. But, uh, you know, there's only so much I'm going to indulge in in an academic talk or work in just sort of, you know, getting into the sensory experience um, or, you know, honestly, this year, the thing in my personal life about whales that is the most preoccupying is that they're not showing up um, where they're supposed to be in the Arctic right now. Like the bowhead whales are about 200 miles north of where they should be. Um, and sort of nobody knows how they're doing up there um, because the sea ice is so far from where it should be. And so in, in many ways, my my personal preoccupations are, are ones of wondering... Um, wondering about their future rather than about their past. Just, I think where many of us are. So uh, I promise to come to the center and thank you for ferrying the, um, the microphone around. Uh, the back center, um, uh, well, I happen to know this, this <laughs> person, so Ben and then the gentleman behind you. And folks, you can kind of um, you know, signal me if, you, if you're gonna have a question while Bathsheba is answering the questions. We're coming close to the end of our time, so I wanna make sure I get to as many folks as possible. Ben, tell us who you are. Uh, my name's Ben. I'm in the history department here, and I'm writing a dissertation on uh, geophysics in the uh, second half of the 20th century. And uh, I love your work. This, this talk was so fabulous. And um, I think Dr. Miller uh, put it correctly when he said that uh, the themes that you've raised are encouraging us uh, to, to stay with the trouble, that there's not an easy resolution to many of these ethical questions, and that the history will go on. Um, but of course, um, that's not necessarily exactly how the historical profession works. <laughs> and um, as your project is coming to a close, um, you're able to present us with all of these things that you've learned, um, which is a, a, a great um, gift. And uh, the question that I have for you is, um, how has this process of researching this project and learning to think in new ways um, shaped your um, decision-making process for deciding how to choose what your next project will be? Ah, that's a great question. I like that you asked that without asking what the second project is, which is so very polite. Um, <laughs> so, and it's a good question because we all have to do it as academics, right? You have to figure out what you're gonna do next. Um, and I played around with a couple of different ideas and I realized that the thing that I found the most generative from this particular project was being able to write about a, a particular physical place um, and get to know that place in a way that uh, kind of directly informed the, um, the structural empirical work that I was doing. And so I wanted to find a place. I decided that was really critical. I had thought about uh, writing a history about human dog relationships because I spent all this time running sled dogs and remained obsessed. Um, but then I, it felt too displaced. It's like, well, where and when and how do you, you know, the, the thing that I found actually allowed me to approach the historical documents differently was knowing that they existed within a physical space and then going to the space and being able to kind of learn something about it. Um, so that actually ended up being really important. And so I picked a second project where I not just could be in a space, but I could go back to the space that I lived in when I first went to the Arctic. Um, so it was, yeah, I just doubled down, basically. <laughs> that global history of the very, very far north is, right. <laughs> uh, and yet deeply situated. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Reed. I'm a first year PhD student in the history department and found your talk incredibly poignant, uh, especially having myself just been in Utkiadvik uh, in April at the beginning of the hunt. Um, I was wondering if you could talk uh, a little bit about the relationship between your case studies. Um, I'm curious about uh, Aliyat, Yupik, Inupiaq people 
employed uh, or involved in either Yankee or Soviet mm -hmm. uh, whale hunting and what the, the in influence in both directions was, both on kind of changing native perceptions as engaging with outsiders and roles that indigenous people might have had in changing the way that outside whalers were thinking about what they were doing? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so the in the, the kind of 19th century Yankee case, um, the, the ships coming up to the Arctic would often directly employ Yupik and Nupiak people on the whaling ships, and particularly after the 1880s when uh, basically the bottom falls out of the capacity for subsistence um, in the Bering Strait, partly because of commercial whaling and walrus hunting, and then partly because the caribou population crashes at the same time. It's like a, there's a terrible kind of crisis of basically every possible thing that you might be able to subsist on in the Arctic. Um, there's many more people start participating in the market hunt. Um, and there seems, um, the, the record on this is not um, I, I wish there was more of it, but what is there indicates that there was kind of a separation drawn between the kind of behavior that was permissible if you were hired on to one of these ships to work for a season, and then the way in which you would whale when you got home. Um, and that there were actually um, just sort of south of Utkiavik uh, in Point Hope, there was a case of somebody who um, was considered to have become too much like a white whaler in the way that he wailed and the way that he treated people, and he was eventually killed by his community. Um, he was doing terrible things. He was, you know, killing other people. He became a real sort of problem. Um, but one of the ways that this was voiced was, you know, you have you have taken on a way of being that is not appropriate. Um, and so that that's sort of tantalizing evidence. I wish I wish I had more. Um, but there certainly was involvement, and the the Yankee whale ships don't talk a lot about um, the Chukchi and the Inupiaq and Yupik whalers that they hire, other than they were really good at what they did, not surprisingly. Um, in the Soviet case, the Soviet Union um, initially kind of supplies local shore-based whalers with good equipment in the early part of the Soviet period, and then after the Second World War basically concludes that indigenous whaling is too wasteful, um, not not because they weren't using all of the whales, but because they were using too much ammunition to kill them, particularly when they were hunting gray whales where you don't need sort of big harpoons. Um, and so they move it all into um, industrial factory type whaling um, and would just sort of whale offshore in these fleet ships that would bring whales in and just drop them off in local communities. Um, so there's kind of a real knowledge gap that formed. Um, like for many communities, the last bowhead that they were allowed to kill was in the 19, you know, early 1950s. And, you know, people will like remember that this is the last year we got a whale. Um, and then the Soviet Union collapses. And along with it, the entire capacity to supply this part of the Bering Strait. And suddenly the necessity of whaling becomes very acute. And actually whalers from Utkiavik and other communities on the Alaskan side go over um, and basically reteach folks how to whale, um, and it becomes really essential practice in Chukotka, and very much inverts the kind of power structure that this had been in place during the Soviet period, where um, ethnic Russians tended to have kind of the most material goods and status within the community. It turns out if you're an ethnic Russian and you don't know anything about whaling and you're useless as a participant, you know, in the 1990s in Chukotka, you were at the bottom of the social hierarchy because you were, you had no function, right? And the the kind of, the Chukchi and the, the Yupik um, actually had much more status and capacity to sort of function um, as they were building whaling back up. Um, so there's this weird moment when native folks are basically just shoved out of whaling entirely. Uh, that striking story of degrowth in a certain way. What happens when the Soviet apparatus collapses is poignant and really nicely rendered. What we're going to do is a cavalcade of three questions, and we're going to do it in three parts. So one question from this section, one question from this section, and one question from this section. And thank you again for uh, helping us with the microphone uh, here. And what we're going to do is take those three and, and ask if okay. you could field the three together. So we'll start with the... Gentlemen here, is there anyone in the second, in the center section? I can happily go to the right or the left. Uh, yes, here on the steps uh, will be second. And then over here, the gentleman in the tan uh, sweater will be our last. 
Hi, I'm no, I'm a PhD student in the biomedical sciences. I was hoping you could expand on your comment that the last two centuries of whaling have been a history of the whales intimating the type of relationship they want to have with humans, and maybe speak to what kind of truth you were trying to convey with that, a, a literal one, a narrative one, a metaphorical one, et cetera. Wonderful question, and uh, Noah, right? Thank you, Noah, and we'll move here to the stairs. Thank you again for taking, I'm grateful. <laughs> I do it myself, yeah. but I think it would get in the way. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm from UMass Boston, actually, from the English department, where I'm, I'm just teaching Moby Dick right now. I'm a 19th century <laughs> Americanist. So whales have been on my mind. Um, so I want to return to the provocation of your title, Do Whales, do whales Judge Us?, which I, I love. Um, by asking about their longevity, um, which I feel like is part of what makes them so charismatic besides their size. Because um, in a sense, they've witnessed this whole history, many of them that you're describing, the rise and fall of the Soviet Union, the discovery of petroleum. Um, and so how might their age function not as um, a, a mechanism for doing a, a, you know, the hierarchy of, of different non-human populations, but as potentially a grounds for catalyzing this kind of alternative m relationship to consumption? Like the fact that they are so old, I wonder if in, in a way that might be a, a way of helping us reimagine how we relate to them. So mm -hmm. can, what work can their the longevity or age do? Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. And you didn't tell us your name. Sorry, Sarah. Thank you, Sari. And here. It's an interest of the, the age question is really interesting, perhaps, and it makes me think of trees. Yeah. Very different. Uh, hi, I'm Sid. Um, I'm a first year PhD student in synthetic systems and quantitative biology. Um, I think that puts me in the prison of quantification. <laughs> um, and Thank you for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I noticed just at the end of your talk, you used the phrase consume well, whereas a lot of the movements today talk about consuming less. And I'm wondering if consuming well to you means consuming less consuming differently or just th changing the way you think about consumption? Thank you very much. If you need help or refreshers on the yeah. question, I'm very happy to chime in. And yes, okay. So I think on the, the question of what I was referring to in um, looking to the whales themselves, um, it's partly metaphorical and it's partly practical. Um, the metaphorical part is in the sense that um, you know, there's a way of reading the historical record in which whales are actually are judging, right? Um, they, they're changing their actions in response to a certain set of human behaviors. Um, and you can kind of read into that because I can't interview them, right? I don't, it, it's a really flimsy source base in many ways. Um, but the, the kind of thought experiment of, of metaphorically reading what they're doing that way gives you a different um, set of judgments on what's happened in the past, right? And the judgments come from a different place. And the judgments come from a place that is far more resonant with a Yupik cosmology than it is with a capitalist or a socialist one. So that's part of what I'm doing with that. The practical piece of it is that I think it's just a call for observation, um, which in some ways gets to the question of consumption, um, which is I think that the the world in which we have manufactured ourselves into being now of, involves consumption without observation, right? We don't see where it comes from. We don't see where it goes when we've disposed of it. Um, and that, you know, if you actually do imagine that the whales have, you know, some sort of moral agency in the world, then you have to observe what they're doing in order to get any information about that for yourself. And that might be more portable outside of the whale example into a, a sort of a larger way in which we interact with the world. Um, and so that would be kind of the metaphorical piece. And in some ways, I think that goes to your question about um, consuming. I think consuming less is in all sorts of ways, at least for the majority of us in a room like this, a piece of consuming well. Um, but I also think that consuming less a, it, um, it puts certain burdens on people that are often easier to meet if you have a particular class position or a certain ability status or, you know, it, it leads to kind of judgments about people in a most recent case who need to use plastic straws, for example. Um, and that becomes sort of mo a moral failing for folks who need to use them for kind of physical reasons because, you know, they might have physiological um, 
reasons for why they have to use those. And, and those become these kind of petty, terrible debates um, that aren't about consuming well for what that particular person is. They're about some sort of blanket judgment. And I think that they also, you know, allow a certain like, well, if I just never use a plastic bag, I have achieved my moral purity status. Um, and in fact, that's probably great if you never use a plastic bag, but consuming well probably implicates more than that. Um, so really, it's just like a demanding move on my part. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and then finally, you're, I, I love this question about longevity. Um, because thinking about bowhead whales or thinking with bowhead whales made me think about time so differently because you know most mammalian time works on either you know cycles that are significantly shorter than than people's like you know arctic foxes live for 3 years um, or kind of extend up to a human lifespan but then you have these animals that are able to completely um, you know they can outlive an entire political system twice over um, and so I think, I think that does help make them charismatic. I think it also, you know, the, what a, a sense of moral judgment looks like from a position where you've experienced what a whale has is probably different, right? Um, I don't know how to access it because I can't interview them. Um, but it is one that has seen much more. Um, so I think that that's, um, that's very true. And I think it also demands of people thinking about the fact that not only are there things that are going to die in order for human life or any life to continue, but there are things that will radically outlive us um, and should radically outlive us. And what world they're going to live in is a thing that we're partly responsible for. Um, and so if you imagine a bowhead whale calf born today that's going to be alive in 200 years, that calf would really like it if there was sea ice around when it was, you know, and for all we know, a 200-year-old bowhead is middle-aged. Um, you know, but there, we actually don't know what the upper age limit for these animals are. So um, I think that, you know, it, it's not just thinking generationally in human generations. It's thinking about what does it mean to think for the generations of many kinds of beings. Thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.